The SD Ruby podcast is brought to you by New Relic. Too many programmers in Riverside, but I run a programming club there called Riverside JavaScript. So if you guys ever find yourself in Riverside, which most of you have no reason to go there, <laughs> uh, you know, stop by and say hi to us. Uh, but yeah, I'm a Ruby developer, so and I actually learned a lot of Ruby coming here to SD Ruby. So when I started getting into it, I'd actually drive down uh, every month, and the guys have been great here. It's a great group. Um, but getting more and more into JavaScript, so finding myself more and more building. Uh, you know, fairly heavy development code, but on the front end. So, and mainly consuming APIs and, you know, showing that data and usually using Backbone or SpineJS for that. Uh, so I decided to give Node.js a shot uh, a couple months ago. Uh, I've played with it before but said, you know what, I'll try to build an API on it and see what it's like. So I chose to build Boxy sign with that, uh, which is what I've been working on basically lately. It's a way to share and sign documents with just a link. Um, so I started out with Node, and building an API wasn't too bad, so I'm just going to talk about the steps to get you guys started with that today. Um, so, uh, assuming you don't know anything about getting started, download and installation for Node is super easy, way easier than Ruby definitely was when I got started you know, three or four years ago. Uh, it's just go there, even if you have a, a Windows computer, install, and you get Node, and you get Node Package Manager. Which is really nice because with Ruby, you basically get Ruby and then you had to install Ruby Gems separately to manage all your gems and things like that. NPM, Node Package Manager, uh, will manage basically what are libraries or gems for Node. Um, so, and it's really it's well done. So, you get both of those commands you get the Node command and NPM command in your binary. Um, and then, you know, once you're done, just check the, what version you have. Uh, I'm on 0.6.12 right now, 0.6.12. I think they've almost got uh, seven or eight officially done now, so I haven't checked. Um, okay, so let's get started setting up the Node.js app. So let's create a folder for whatever you want to call your app. We'll call this one node slash API. And let's create a package.json file, which is really similar to a gem file, uh, but we're going to put our information in it for node stuff. And then an app.copy file, which will run our app. So it'll be really, it'll be more similar to a Sinatra app than a real app. So it's sort of like you're building a Sinatra app with your gem file. Um, so uh, after you create those, let's hop over to looking at those. This is what your package.json file looks like. So you just need to start by name, uh, version, uh, you know, who you are, and then you need to specify your main file. I'm doing everything in CoffeeScript, so if you guys are fans of just JavaScript, then you guys probably really know JavaScript well, so go ahead and use that. Otherwise, I actually recommend, because Riverside JS is mostly beginners uh, trying to learn programming and things, and JavaScript's a nice spot for them to get started. But I actually recommend CoffeeScript. It's clean, it's nice, uh, it works great with Node, uh, and it's easier to read. So even for the slides, it's nicer. So app.coffee is the main file, and then I'm going to specify the dependencies, which I need CoffeeScript here because we're using it. Otherwise, we would just need Express. And Express will be our Sinatra essentially. So Express is a library like Sinatra, like Rails, that we're going to use on top of Node. So we don't have to write like pure Node code, which is uh, just more difficult. So uh, I don't think anyone uses pure Node code too much. If they're building more like an app or API, they use it more if they're doing like high efficiency stuff. So if you're just getting started with Node, use Express. It's great. So our app.copy file, we'll call Express, set it to a variable. Um, then we run express there, which is a command on top of express. Uh, we're going to use the body parser, that's actually going to be later, basically, so we can accept post statements and easily parse them and do what we want with it. Uh, and then we're going to set our first route. So if you guys have used Sinatra before, you can see it's pretty similar. We're just calling, we want a get request at root, uh, and we're getting request response back, and we're sending a response to the API. So if you open this up in your browser after running it, uh, you see just API up there. So you can pass HTML there, et cetera, whatever you want. So that's like the basics of it, and you can start doing views and things like that. So uh, which we won't talk about today, but you can get to you know more advanced views and things. So 
You obviously don't want to write huge long strings of HTML in there. Okay, so, so we've set up a file, we've you know installed our, our uh, packages, so when we run ran npm install that installed express and copy script for us. Then we ran from the command line copy app.copy that actually runs the node server but through copy script. And then we were able to browse to local host. And we were able to see the term API. So now let's add our first route. So we're going to add uh, this API slash test.json. And then we got to restart our server. I'll talk about how you know there's tools so you don't have to do that, just like Sinatra has its own tool. Um, but we're just going to restart stuff so by hand for now, and then we're going to browse to that. So, and all these things are up on GitHub if you guys want. This, the gists are all mentioned here. And I actually have a, uh, um, a repo up there, but I didn't link to it in here. So, uh, just go to github.com slash scottmott, and you should pull the find it. Um, okay, so now our copy file got a little more involved. We're, we're adding a git route for api slash test.json. So we could do .xml if you wanted, or you know .html, or you can pass any format there. You put dot colon format question mark, and it would allow you know any format. So maybe you're building a JSON API, but you don't care if they do .json or if they do .xml. You just still are going to send JSON. You can put dot format there, and then we're going to just respond with JSON. And we're just going to respond with the success true. So if we run that, uh, we'd end up seeing you know app slash test.json and we see a success true. So we're starting to build our API already. So let's get to adding some testing to make sure our requests are working because uh, we're going to work our way up to you know adding some authentication. So let's update package.json to add Mocha. Mocha is like our spec basically. There's a lot of different testing uh, tools in JavaScript right now in the node world. Um, so nothing's like really locked down on what I recommend but so far, Mocha is pretty good, so you guys can use Mocha. I'll show it to you in a bit. Uh, and then we're going to add under the test folder, app underscore test.copy. And we're just going to do request checks. So I'm not going to get into any or anything like that. We're just going to make sure that our API is responding with what we expect to do. Uh, and then we'll start our server and run the script. So our package JSON file will now look like this. We've added Mocha, request and should, should will be like, you know, should have this, should be blank, that sort of thing. So you kind of see that with Node, you're having to add more gems than maybe we're used to if you started with Rails, because so much is just a part of Rails. Um, so everything is a lot more compartmentalized. But you know, nowadays, because we've gotten used to gem files and things like that, this is pretty similar. Okay, and this is our, this should be our app underscore test.copy file. But you can see we're requiring request and should so that we can use them. And similar to our spec, we're saying like describe this route. And then we're saying it should return a success response. We're calling request.get URL. So you know, that's just the rules of the request library. <coughs> and we either get an error back. So usually Node will try to send an error first. Uh, and then, if not, it'll send a response. So you pass those two in a callback, basically. Uh, and here, we're just looking for the response to be success true. And then we call done at the end. Okay, so let's add uh, HTTP auth, because that'll be one of the first things we actually need to like, you know, authenticate. So I haven't got into adding models or anything like that. We're going to do that last. Um, but so HTTP auth, we need an API token. And we'll add some tests for that. So here I'm basically just saying, OK, I want to call slash sessions and pretend I'm logging in. So I want to say, you know, call in my email and password, whatever it is, and it should return a token for me. And then I'm going to take that token and I'm going to use it with the rest of my requests for my API. I'm just going to use that as a basic auth API token. And you can, you know, deal later with making sure that token gets changed out or, you know, expired and things like that. Uh, but I'm not, you know, getting into all the model stuff and things like that that automatically comes with Rails yet. We're just doing some plain text passing in there. So we're making sure email is equal to the valid email, which we have set as a constant there, and password is equal to the constant for password there. And if it's success, we'll get true. So we add some specs for that. 
So we've got you know correct email password combo, the wrong password combo, and a non-existent email. Uh, and so we've already you know we're simulating sessions. So let's go on and let's go ahead and say now that we've got a session token back, let's authenticate against that uh, token via the authorization header. So we're going to add a bit of code here, uh, a class. So in CoffeeScript, you can write prototypal inheritance with classes, which I think is really nice because uh, it's familiar. Um, so we've, been, we've got two methods here, request basic auth. That's going to check our authorization header. You know, take the parsed, the basic D4 uh, password and get us our API token, get us that API token back. Then we can use that API token to make sure it's an API person that we can log in with. So we're basically checking, is that API token a valid API token? So where you see that constant valid API token, uh, instead, we, you know, once we get to it, you would do an actual lookup on that and make sure it's in the database. Right now we're just using the constant. Uh, and if it is, then proceed with a next. So Express has something called next in it, which means basically, okay, go to the next step. So where that's happening is you have authentication here, and you basically have this, it's kind of like a before filter. You have require API person, and it's checking, okay, make sure that API person exists. Otherwise, send a, you know, success false, please use a working authentication token. If it's good, next, go to the next step. Okay. And then we'll add our test for that. You can see it's just basic auth, passing the token, the username, no password there. This is really similar to an API like gumroad.com. Okay, so we've done that, we've basically done session authentication, so now we could start writing routes like we need, but we don't have people. So let's go ahead and figure out a way to persist to a database so people can log in, we can create them, and that sort of thing. So let's add a post route. So we've added Mongoose. So uh, Mongoose is a popular one, MongoDB for dealing with uh, Node. Uh, Redis is also popu popular, um, but you can use you know, MySQL, things like that. There's libraries for all of those, so whatever your choice. We're going to add our create. So here we're calling new person from the model. So if you see that third line there, we're requiring a file called models person. We'll look at that next which is basically you know, a person model, specifying our schema for the person. Uh, and then, you know, very similar to Rails, you know, Ruby and anything for that matter, we're instantiating it, setting the email and the password from the body that was passed in. And then on the save, uh, we're either saving success false if there's an error, use for error, otherwise we're going to end responding to true. And we should probably add there, you know, respond with the person attributes. And this is going to be hard for you guys to see, but basically we're specifying a schema for email encrypted password. Encrypted password using bcrypt to encrypt it. And then we have a virtual attribute called password that takes that and sets it to encrypted password. And we have a little bit of validation down at the bottom to make sure there's an email and password. So we haven't written too much code, and there's you know, really only three files in a test file, so it's everything nice and light. Here's our test. Calling it before each just to clear the collection. And then running our request specs. And that's it. So, next steps would be um, require API person. Oops. So, then you know, go ahead and add more routes and models, and you'd authenticate against the API person. Uh, where we were just passing the hard-coded, you know, valid API token. So we'd actually need to add an API token and get, get creative for the person, and then just check on that in the required API person, which was, the method was right there. So instead of checking for valid API token, you actually do a lookup, just similar to, you know, how you use active record to do a lookup. And that's uh, building an API with Node.js.
Yeah, anyone have questions? What, I mean, why would a person opt to use this as opposed to sit up for an API? Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to get into those kind of questions. For me, it was more experimental to actually try it out. Uh, definitely, you're going to get a, like a higher uh, request rate. So Sinatra will do like a thousand requests a second, and you're looking at like four thousand requests a second with a node app. So if you're going out after request rate or Rails, I think it's like three or four hundred. You're really good right there. Um, part of it is definitely for me was to learn and understand Node because it's got more popular, with the potential of eventually using Socket IO to do kind of more like some live type streaming API. Go for it. Um, so, ex I'm not sure if this is true, but like Express is like a framework that handles views and everything, like it, a full stack, as it were. Exactly. Almost handles views. It provides a hook to add views in, and then you choose what kind of views you want. So, for example, a popular views uh, library is called J Templates. Really similar to Haml, but you're writing it with JavaScript. So, I was wondering if you would recommend, I mean, it, would you recommend that library if you were strictly building a back end and you weren't going to be dealing with any type of views, or is there like another node library that might be more appropriate? Uh, no, I'd still recommend Express. Okay. Yeah. So it's so you're saying if if you use only views rather than JSON, or you're saying no, I'm saying like you're building a purely back end API using Node. It doesn't need to generate views or anything like that. That's correct. Yeah, you don't need any of that. So you could just send the JSON in plain text. There's also though view templates to help build the JSON as well, similar to like JSONify in the Ruby world. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's tools there for that. Someone else on the side? Good. So once those routes get out of hand, what do you do? Uh, you you start breaking them up into other files. So you know you start having a slash people file, drop all your routes into there, and then a slash you know. Uh, you know, whatever you have. So whatever is different you include it app. Yeah, app. 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 Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So app.coffee you can come to your spot to bring everything in. Is there the equivalent of um, rescue for Node.js? Rescue? Rescue. Oh background jobs. Background jobs? No. Uh, no oh, JS or rescue. Oh is there an equivalent? Yes, there is. Um, you can use rescue. You can I'm Fairly sure you can actually use rescue with Node too. But then see that. Do you write jobs in JavaScript or do you write it well, in Because rescue, the, the big thing about rescue is it's kind of a standard of the queue. So they've written a client that looks at the same exact data that the Ruby client looks at and pulls jobs off of it. So you can have your client or your server both speaking to it. It doesn't matter what language they're in as long as they speak to the same data language. But I, I think there is a rescue rewritten in JavaScript that's very similar. So talking to a Redis backend. I think there's one talking to MongoDB too, or MongoDB. Um, yeah. Okay. How long did it take you to uh, feel comfortable in Node? How long have you been using it? Yeah, I've, I've been using it for about two months now. You know, just it's my side time, side project basically. Um, but I mean, probably it took me about 40 hours to start feeling more comfortable. The hardest thing when you start getting into Node, so I think Node is a good choice potentially for APIs because you don't have to write a whole lot of code. At least you shouldn't be. You know, your APIs should be doing simple things, and then you know you build your app to make multiple requests of your API. Um, the hardest thing is you start getting this code that can get really, really nested. Um, if you're not careful. And then you basically have to build a lot of callback type logic, um, which is a little tricky. So to get you know that speed with Node and things like that, you have to be careful of that. And I'm not really aware of all that stuff yet either. So it's an experiment for me to learn, learn and understand that stuff better. Because there is a problem with Node that if you aren't running, running stuff that's going to be asynchronous, then you're not going to get that like 4,000 requests a second. You're actually going to really like slow down your app really bad. So you do have to be careful with things like that. I I'm not I haven't done that for a while, but um, last time I used it, it was really hard to see the callback stack. Is that still the case, or have they fixed that problem? Like I couldn't see what call. Like if I had an error occur, oh, if I yeah. called backs deep, I couldn't see what the 
what the stack trace was for that call when that error got thrown. Yeah, it's a little better, but it's actually not too much better, it seems like, in the coffee script because it will give me the line of the compiled JavaScript. So yeah, I do have to hunt around you a little more. Because things. everything is fancy. Yeah, so because of the architecture, you cannot actually get stack trace. Yeah, that's the hard part. OK. Do you more? So do you have any tips on like, or things you for debugging if you get well down into the callback? You know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, console.log, so I just use so it. It's kind of like, uh, you know. Like you know, you say with like Ruby, you know, puts driven development. It's kind of like yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's console not long for me at least. There, I, there might be a tool out there that's a little better. So, okay, anyone else? If you uh, if you're really interested in Node, I'll put a plug in for one of our sponsors, Peep Code. Uh, Jeff Rosenbach has a beautiful two part series on Node.js on his website. That is some of the best technical documentation in a video format that I've ever seen. So I highly recommend if you're interested in Node. Uh, check that out because he does a great job of explaining it, especially from someone who has a Rails perspective of the world. He kind of explains the equivalencies between them and where they really differ. So if you're interested, check out Ecode. Okay, thanks, guys.